Hi everyone, welcome back to the Curly Boys Theatre after our one hour break. Hope you're doing well and if you got your uh, lightning talk submissions in, just a reminder that um, that'll be happening tomorrow. So next up we have Dawn with This Talk Has Been Disabled. Um, I have Dawn live with us now and this talk will be I think a pre-record, is that right Dawn? It will be a pre-record, it is also captioned. Um, before we do run the video, I would like to acknowledge, because I did not do it in the pre-record, that the video was recorded on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would like to pay my respect to both their elders, past, present and emerging, and also to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mentors from across Australia that I had growing up. And I would like to acknowledge that both the Wurundjeri land and the land of all other Aboriginal people in Australia is still their land. It always will be, it always was, and that their sovereignty was never ceded. Um, I think we are good to roll it. Oh, I just wanted to say before we do that, sorry, um, just to warn uh, anybody who needs the content warning, um, there's a brief mention of the 2020 Australian bushfires and the COVID-19 pandemic in this talk. Um, some mentions of injections and implanted medical devices and discussion of a proof of concept hack that could be used for murder. Um, and uh, Dawn, is it correct that you'll be in the comments for this talk as the talk's rolling? Yes, I will be. Um, you'll also find me in the video chat afterwards. Excellent. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And um, yeah, I think, I think now we can roll it. Yeah, let's roll it. Hello everyone and welcome to PyCon 2020. It's very good to see you in the comfort of your own homes. Now, I was supposed to come here today to talk to you about accessibility, but unfortunately, as I was setting everything up to give this talk, I discovered that my talk had been disabled. So I'm actually going to spend the next 45 minutes explaining to you how you would go about re-enabling it. You can ask any questions that you have at the end of the talk, or I imagine that I'll be around in the chat. So first of all, who am I? Well, my name is Dawn and I'm a DevOps slash SRA type person. I tend to wear a lot of hats. One of the hats that I wear is the hat of an accidental accessibility advocate, which is why I'm here giving this talk to you today. Outside of work, I am an occasional author and kitchen alchemist. Sometimes that ends really well, sometimes it doesn't. I'm also a raging sports ball fan, which is why that picture of me up there is me at Marvel Stadium and why I'm currently wearing a New England Patriots jersey while giving this talk. So most of that is fairly self-explanatory, but accidental accessibility advocate. I mean, the accessibility advocate bit is fairly straightforward, but how do you become an accidental accessibility advocate? Well, to explain that, we're going to need to take a bit of a world tour. And that world tour starts in England, where we have this excellent disabled toilet that is down the stairs. Not really the best place to have a disabled toilet, considering that most of the people that use disabled toilets can't get downstairs, but maybe the rest of the world is better, right? Well, once again, we're going to stay in the UK to have a look at this disabled toilet, which we found, or which someone at a festival photographed which not only has a handle, which is really difficult to open, but also has a piece of paper pinned to the door saying, door sticking, please pull hard. Yeah, probably not too many of the users of that bathroom are going to have the capability to pull hard. Next, we're going to head over to New Zealand, um, where we have this excellent access ramp to a building, uh, which someone has obscured by putting a couple of orange traffic cones in front of it. The power chair user who's sitting and looking at it is probably not very pleased because they can't get into wherever they wanted to go. And finally, we're going to have a look at the city that I live in, and that is Melbourne, which has these exaloos, which people generally describe as uh, space age public toilets. They're great, they're self cleaning. So, why are they in a world tour about accessibility advocacy? Well, that's because. The Exaloos in Melbourne actually have braille on all of their signage and inside the toilet there is a sign that explains that when the light on the sign goes on one should vacate the toilet because it is about to enter its cleaning routine. Unfortunately the braille text in that toilet says 
exactly the same thing. I mean, there's a thing there about being blind and not being able to see light? I don't know. So, before we continue, it would probably be helpful to define a couple of terms. First of all, disability is pretty much defined as a continuing condition which restricts everyday activities. So, legally in Australia, continuing condition means a condition that's going to last for six months or more. And the restricting everyday activities bit is pretty self-explanatory. Accessibility is not just about disability though, it's really about the degree to which an activity can be done by everyone. And some things might be inaccessible to disabled people, but accessible to non-disabled people. But you might also have things that are accessible to say white people but not to black people, or me to men but not to women. And warning, this is where we get political for a moment. So there are roughly two different ways that one can consider accessibility. You can look at disability and accessibility in terms of the medical model, which holds that it's disability itself that's the problem and that that's something that we should try to fix. Alternatively, you can look at the social model, which holds that it's not really the disability that's the problem, it's the fact that the worlds are not designed with disability in mind and so things end up being inaccessible. And that's sort of illustrated by these pictures that we've got up here, where we have, to illustrate the medical model, we have the vaguely doctor-looking blob comforting the blob in a wheelchair. On the other hand, with the social model, when it's done well, you get things like adaptive sport. And so we've got these folks who are playing sport in wheelchairs, and let's be honest, they look pretty happy with that. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to look at disability in terms of the social model. I wouldn't want to dismiss the medical model entirely, because there has been a lot of things in the world that have improved because of the medical model, but we'll just focus on the social model for the moment. There are a couple more terms then that we need to define. So accessible design is about building a world that everyone can navigate and use. Now, I said that that's not just about disability. Some of you who've been around for a while might remember HP's racist webcam in 2009, where uh, a black gentleman had taken a video of himself with HP's face tracking webcam. It couldn't track his face, but it could track the face of his white colleague. That's the kind of thing that we talk about when we're talking about accessible design. And a lot of accessible design for disability is about things like making sure that people can get in buildings, but also things like making sure that people can use technology. Which brings us to adaptive technology, and that's roughly tools that disabled people use to improve their access to the world. Now that can actually be really low tech. This, my walking stick, is a piece of adaptive technology. Wheelchairs are adaptive technology. But as sort of technology in general has become more of a thing in society, we have adaptive technology like screen readers, which blind and dyslexic people might use to get around websites. We have adaptive technology like AAC, which is used by non-speaking people to communicate. So adaptive technology really runs the gamut. And for the vast majority of you here today, if not all of you, this is part of your job. Doesn't matter whether you're a designer, a coder, a DevOps person, even a manager. Accessibility is something that you should consider every day when you go to work, because if you don't do it, then who will? Now, you may be wondering how you would go about doing that, and the first thing that I want to talk about here is this idea that accessible design is good design. And that doesn't mean that if you design things well, they'll be inherently accessible. It doesn't mean that accessible design is good, although that's also often true. What it means is that part of good design and part of designing things well is considering accessibility and make sh making sure that you design things accessibly. Generally, what I've found is that if your website or blog or application is badly designed, it's probably also going to be inaccessible. Let's look at a case in point. This is armgren.net, and I didn't have to look very hard to find this. It's actually on quite a number of top 10 worst websites ever lists. Now, you can see when you're looking at it, it's not really very logical. There's not a consistent layout. There are a lot of images that are all different sizes. The text is all different sizes. There's a huge number of colors. I mean, maybe it would make more sense if you spoke Norwegian, but it's still not really the easiest website in the world to get around. And indeed, if you look at the accessibility of arngren.net, that's also not great. For starters, just imagine how hard it would be to work out what's going on if you're colorblind. There's a lot of red and green there. 
Because nothing's in a logical order, it's really hard if you're using keyboard navigation or if you're using a screen reader to actually get around the website. A lot of the pictures don't have alt text and a lot of the pictures aren't even placed in logical places. So someone with an intellectual or cognitive disability might not actually understand what's linked to what. And then we have distinctive design. This is Ling's cards. Now, Ling's Cars, interestingly enough, is actually one of the most successful car leasing businesses in the UK. And Ling, the owner, has really built her brand around having this website that kind of, it's very unique, very distinctive, and it draws people in. And it's accessible in some aspects, but not in others. So if you want to actually take a look at the website, I mean, you can't really see it in the screenshot, but the tongue is animated. The traffic lights are animated, Ling's face is animated, and my favourite, which I couldn't actually get into the screenshot, is that just below the YouTube video, Ling has an animated gif of Boris Johnson describing the Boris Brexit guarantee, which is the guarantee that if the UK leaves the European Union, which it now has, then the cost of leasing your car will not go up. But as far as accessibility goes, some of those animated elements can actually be an issue for people with photosensitive epilepsy. And the title of the, the, title of the page is basically done in word art. That doesn't actually have alt text. Not all of the pictures on the page have alt text. It doesn't scale very well, as you can see. And if you're trying to get around the page, then some of the menu options are very, very difficult to get around with a keyboard or a screen reader. And that doesn't mean that designing websites like this is bad or that it's something that you shouldn't do. It just means that you might have to think about if you're designing something that's really distinctive, you might have to sort of think about ways, you know, how can I make this more accessible? What's the extra effort that I need to put in? Now, if we're looking at an example of good design, here's something that probably a lot of people here use on a fairly regular basis, and that is GitHub. And GitHub is not perfect as far as accessibility goes, but it's a well-designed website that has a reasonable accessibility baseline. To start with, if we have a look at the information up there, you can see that it's not a sort of home contents help. You've got the search bar, and then in the top bar there, you've got pull requests, issues, marketplace, and explore. And that's really good because if you're using a screen reader, those are a lot of the places that you tend to go to a lot using GitHub, so it's really easy to get to them. Even with that bar, even with that bar on the screen, which explains to you what type of code is in this code base, that is information that's conveyed with color. But if you mouse over that, you actually get a tooltip that gives you text. Or if you navigate over that with a screen reader, you get a tooltip that gives you text. So there's no way that they're conveying information only using color. It's, it scales fairly well. The forms are fairly easy to read. And as a matter of fact, this is actually the repository for NVDA, which is a free and open source screen reader for Windows. And the reason that NV Access, which is the company that produces NVDA, uses GitHub is because they've worked out that for their blind and visually impaired users, it's the easiest way for them to be able to navigate around the page and submit issues. Now, there are a lot of resources that you can use if you're interested in accessible design and doing this well. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are kind of the starting point for anyone who wants to make sure that their website or other software is accessible. And the Accessibility Project has produced effectively a plain language version of these, which is a bit easier to understand and go through if you want to make sure that your website is accessible. Speaking of plain language, and intellectual and cognitive disabilities are not something that I'm going to touch on very much in this talk. But something that's really good to do is to have a look at the US federal government's plain language standards, because what these do is they explain to you, if you have a website that's very reliant on text, how you can phrase that text in a way that's very easy for people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities to understand. And if you're a DevOps person like me, or you develop with a lot of pipelines, then you can actually automate a lot of this. So there's also a list of tools for accessibility testing, and you can take a lot of those and you can automate them straight into your CI CD pipelines, which means that you can pick off the low hanging fruit and make sure that they work, which will take a lot of the workload off of your QAs. Now, Christy Veers is a blind person who produced a video explaining how she uses the iPhone's accessibility features. And this is something that I recommend that everyone who's interested in accessibility should watch.
not because it's a great resource on how to do it, but because it shows you what's possible when you really think about and design things with accessibility in mind. I mean, the iPhone has a braille keyboard. It has a great number of features in terms of voice activation and in terms of being able to use your phone if you're blind or visually impaired in a way that a lot of us wouldn't think about. But they've done that because they've designed it with the needs of blind users in mind. So I absolutely recommend checking that out. Now, color blindness is a really common accessibility requirement. About 5% of the population, mostly men, are color blind. And one tool that I recommend that you use is the Color Oracle Desktop Filter. Now, there are a lot of other tools which are sort of in browser, you know, add-ons for Chrome or Firefox that you can use to see what a website is, looks like to someone who's colorblind. The reason that I recommend Color Oracle over those websites is because Color Oracle is a desktop application. So it doesn't just have to be websites. Like if you're developing mobile apps or if you're developing native applications for Windows or iOS, you can actually use Color Oracle to see what those applications look like for people with all different types of colorblindness. And as far as using screen readers, the Patch Yellow group have put together this really good list of basic screen reader commands so that if you need to be able to navigate around your website with a screen reader, you can pull up that list and it contains commands for three of the most common screen readers, JAWS, NVDA, and VoiceOver. And you can use that to make sure that you can get around your website with a screen reader. The last one that I think is actually really important to call out is the Photosensitive Epilepsy Analysis Tool, or PEAT, which was developed by researchers at the University of Maryland. The reason that that's really important is that photosensitive epilepsy is actually a major health risk in terms of having elements on your websites or in your software that can cause seizures. And because it's a major health risk, you can't ask people with photosensitive epilepsy to test that. So the researchers at the University of Maryland have created this completely automated tool, which will allow you to do it yourself. Now, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are a good starting point, but one thing that's useful to bear in mind about guidelines is that they often actually don't tell the whole story. Let's look at a few of the ways that that kind of manifests. So there are a lot of things that guidelines don't teach you. And to start with, what happens if someone has accessibility requirements that the guidelines don't cover? And this is one that really gets on my goat because minimum font size on websites is really relevant to me. And that's not in the web content accessibility guidelines. They do specify that you should be able to zoom websites up to 200 times, but I can tell you from experience that 200 times six point font is still pretty small. So you want to consider if you are developing a website, what happens if you've got users that have requirements that aren't in the guidelines? What if different groups of people have clashing requirements? And you can look at that in terms of visual impairments where you'll have people whose eyes will let in different amount of, amounts of light. You can look at that in terms of perhaps autistic users or users with migraines might have different requirements to someone who needs a light mode. And so you want to make sure when you have different groups of people that have clashing requirements that you have a certain amount of customization and light mode and dark mode are a really good thing to call out here or you can allow users to customize the website themselves. What if you're overwriting someone's local accessibility settings? And this happens depressingly frequently that there are posts on blogs or forums or someone calls up a call center and they say, hey, I use a high contrast mode on my computer and I've tried to install your desktop software and it's, over it's overwriting my high contrast mode. And if someone does that, you want to make sure that your response is sort of, OK, let's get that sorted out and work with you. But the best thing that you can do is to not have that issue in the first place. So make sure that you test it so that you know you're not overwriting someone's local accessibility settings. What if the guidelines are misleading? And most often they're not going to be. But there were some researchers who were interested in how button color and contrast were affected by color blindness. And so they recruited some colorblind folks and some non colorblind folks for basically a study where they looked at blue buttons with black text on a white background and blue buttons with white text on a white background. And what they found was that sort of mid blue buttons with the black text, even though that would meet the web content accessibility guidelines on a white background, it was actually harder to see than the white text, which failed the web content accessibility guidelines contrast checkers. So that's something that's worth calling out. 
You also have to look at what if the guidelines priorities are wrong for your use case. For example, if you have a website with a lot of deaf and hard of hearing users, you're going to want to focus on things like sign language interpreting and captioning audio. But if you're using a guideline that's intended for blind users, that's going to focus on really different things. So you want to make sure that if you have a particular user base, you sort of have an understanding of that. What if the guidelines only cover good, not better? And I like to talk about this generally in terms of the 80-20 rule, because 80% of accessibility requirements you can solve with 20% of the work, but that other 20% will be about 80% of the work. And that will be when people make those blog posts or they call into your call center and they say, hey, I've got this issue. So you wanna make sure that they have an easy way to contact you so that you end up being aware of those things. And you want to make sure that you address them. Now, for a lot of accessibility talks, this would be the point where the person giving the talk would explain to you how to do everything right. This is not one of those talks. And the reason for that is that I think it's often very instructive to actually look at what people do wrong so that you can learn from the common mistakes that people make. This is Atlassian Confluence. And I imagine that a lot of the people who are in the audience today will probably have used Confluence. For those who haven't, it's basically a central repository for documentation across a company, and a lot of big companies use it. Now, it looks fairly logical, right? You've got a test space, you've got some information on the left-hand side that tells you about what's going on, you've got a whole lot of information in the center that explains to you how you would actually go about starting up with this test space. You can create a page and you'll see a dialog like this appear. And then once you've actually created that page, the page itself looks like this. That looks fine, right? Let's go back and take another look at that. Now, as you can see, even though this test page is created in MySpace, which, you know, because my name's up there, I wasn't actually the person that created this. This page was created by someone called Matthew Gregory. And Matt, at the time that I started doing this talk, was my manager. And here's why he created that and not me. Because when I tried to create the page on my zoomed in screen, the create button was cut off the bottom of the pop up dialogue. Oops. So the options within the pop-up itself can be scrolled, but because the create button is cut off the bottom of the screen, this basically meant that for a while, until Atlassian fixed it, every time I wanted to create a Confluence page, I had to go and get someone to do it for me, which is not really very convenient. So how do we improve this? Well, the first thing that's important is to make sure that all of your UI elements are scrollable and that nothing's cut off by the bottom of the screen. So one way that you might solve an issue like this is to set it up so that someone using a zoomed in screen can actually scroll that create dialog from top to bottom. You also generally want to test your pop-up windows for accessibility. So you want to make sure that if there's more information that you need to sort of go through that pop-up window, that on a zoomed in screen, it's not being blocked out by other UI elements. And you want to make sure that they can be navigated using adaptive technology. So things like screen readers and people using zoomed in screens, does it appear to them in a way where they're still able to get around? Now, the best thing to do is either to increase your screen size yourself or get some users and magnified screens to come in and test your application because they do it every day. So they're generally going to be able to work out what the issues are much more readily than you are. Now, I don't use screen readers. So I wasn't the person who actually said, I need a human screen reader. This was my friend's grandmother who was very tech savvy, but due to a degenerative disease later on in life, she became blind. Now, she was a person of faith. And as she found it more difficult to sort of get out into the world and go to her faith community in person, she substituted that with the Patheos website, which bills itself as hosting the conversation on faith. And in late 2016, when she started using Patheos, it looked something like this. And this is a screenshot from the Wayback Machine. And you can see that for visual users, it's fairly easy to sort of see what's going on and get around it. And it wasn't perfect for screen readers, but it wasn't too bad. Like you were reasonably readily able to navigate your way around all of the menus, get to pages and read what was going on on them. Then in sort of late 2017, early 2018, Patheos went through a redesign. And after the redesign, the page looked like this. Now the issues with this page aren't immediately obvious, 
But the only reason for that is because the pop-up advertisements and auto-playing videos that Pathéos added to their website are so obnoxious that modern browsers actually block them on site. You see that text up there that says advertisement? I wasn't using an ad blocker when I took this. Safari thought that the, web, that the advertisement on the website was so obnoxious that it just blocked it. And one of the things with auto-playing videos is if you're using a screen reader, they actually talk over the screen reader. And that made my friend's grandmother feel something like this. She didn't really want to be at her computer anymore. She didn't really want to use Pathéos. She was very frustrated about it. Now, if you want to look at an example closer to home in terms of how doing this well can really help people, Coles, the retailer, actually got sued by a screen reader user because they redesigned their website and she went from being able to place an order on Coles Online using her screen reader to not being able to do it. Now, Coles actually settled that case and part of the settlement was that they committed to making sure that their website was accessible to screen reader users and met the web content accessibility guidelines. So now, if you want to look at a good example of how to do accessibility, Coles is one, and that's because they know they've got to do it. Oops. So the sound on auto-playing videos does actually talk over screen readers, but part of the problem is that if you can't see the video on the page, it can be really hard to close it. Because pop-up advertisements will often take screen readers to a new page, and that makes websites very hard to navigate. Because if you're using a screen reader and you don't expect that, you'll be looking for anchors that will kind of tell you where you need to go, and you may not actually be able to find them. The worst bit about it, and this holds for both pop-up advertisements and videos, is that often their dismiss trigger or their close or their little X actually isn't visible to the screen reader or keyboard navigation user. And that means that you can't close it at all. And sometimes you have to just reload the page. Now, Apple does accessibility very well. And Safari has this really cool feature called reader mode. And what you can do is for any website, you can turn that on and you can get just text and pictures, nothing else, no pop-up ads, no auto-playing videos. The thing with that though, is that in order to do that, you have to be using well-formed HTML, which the Pathéos designers weren't. And so that meant that reader mode, which was something that my friend's grandmother often used as an alternative option, didn't work for her either. So how do we improve it? Well, it probably seems obvious, but let users decide whether they want to play videos instead of auto-playing them. It makes everyone's life so much easier. It's really just good design. And it's especially important because those auto-playing videos will talk over screen reader users. Another thing that's really good to do is to make sure that if you do have to have pop-up elements or pop-up advertisements or auto-playing videos, there's a clear dismiss or close trigger and it's easy for a keyboard navigation user or screen reader to actually get to that because then it means that they can get rid of it and they can go about doing what they wanted to do. Now, it's always a good idea to check to see whether reader mode works on your website for Safari users. You can do that just by going to the website and seeing in the address bar, there will be a link that will say, load this in reader mode. If that's grayed out, then it means that your HTML needs to be properly formed before the site will be viewable using reader mode. And the best thing to do is put on a blindfold, cover your screen and use a screen reader yourself. You'll learn very quickly that it's actually quite difficult to do, but not only will it help you build empathy, but if you compare what the screen reader shows you to what you actually see visually, you'll quite quickly pick up a lot of those issues that screen reader users will face. Does anyone here remember GeoCities? Now, Obviously, there's no audience response today, but I'm willing to bet that some of you have been around for long enough that you do remember it. For those who don't, websites that were created with GeoCities tended to look something like this. I mean, it's very 90s, isn't it? That penguins animated. The colours are pretty clashing. I mean, it would probably make more sense if you spoke Thai, but there's a lot of word art, a lot of fonts that aren't particularly intuitive, and a lot of GeoCities was really like that. The only thing that's missing is the giant scrolling rainbow bar at the top of the screen. Now, GeoCities is actually dead. Yahoo killed it off, I believe, in March of 2019. Unfortunately, now, there are a lot of folks in the design world who are around in the day of GeoCities. And some of them have taken some of these elements and actually incorporated them into their corporate websites. 
One of my friends who has photosensitive epilepsy actually had a really interesting run-in with one of these designers who had decided that when he was going to redesign his company's corporate website that they were going to have a giant strobing pink element that covered about the top two-thirds of the screen. Which is basically the equivalent of taking your fancy corporate website, we are very amazing and we will show you why, and putting a Yan cat on it, which is probably not something that I'd recommend doing for business. Now, my friend who works in the IT industry had heard about this company and she was very interested to find out what they did. So she went to their corporate website to check it out and because there was a giant strobing pink element on the front page, she had a seizure. And that resulted in a phone call that I suspect that the designer probably didn't want to have. Oops. So flashing, flickering and strobing effects are a pretty major cause of seizures for people with photosensitive epilepsy. And one of the reasons why this website was such an issue is that saturated reds and pinks, which are at one end of the wavelength spectrum, are much more likely to trigger seizures for folks with photosensitive epilepsy. The other thing that's an issue is high contrast effects. So if you have, say, bright red flashing to white, that's going to be much more likely to cause a seizure than dark blue flashing to dark green, because there's a lot less contrast there. Photosensitive epilepsy is, though, a spectrum from mild to severe. And so some folks like my friend, who are on the more severe end of that spectrum, will tend to have to deal with those issues more frequently. So it's a really good thing to try and make sure that you do design with this in mind. So how do we improve it then? Well, you should probably avoid using flashing, flickering and strobing effects if you possibly can, because not only can they trigger photosensitive epilepsy, but they can also be a distraction for folks with things like ADHD. If you look at a lot of the back of a lot of video game cases, they will actually have warnings on them that say there are flashing, flickering and strobing effects in this game and it may trigger photosensitive epilepsy. And that's why those warnings are there. So as well as warning people, if you do need to use those kinds of effects, you want to make sure that they're as small as possible and as low contrast as you can possibly get them. So some dark blue flashing to dark green in a corner is not going to be as much of an issue than the big pink strobe at the top of the corporate website. And again, you do want to avoid using saturated reds and pinks if you possibly can. Now, if your website does absolutely need to have flashing effects or animations, one thing that you can do is to give users the option to disable them, because that means that folks with things like photosensitive epilepsy or ADHD still have the option to experience the website, even if it's not necessarily in the way that you intended. Now, there is actually a certain amount of precedent for disabled people being involved in integrated sports. And that can be everything from kids playing in the schoolyard all the way up to Olympic medalists like Reto Ildiko, the Hungarian fencer, and Im Dong Hyun, the Korean archer. Now, in the modern day, obviously as technology has become more of a thing, sports have evolved. And one thing that's come out of that is esports. And this case study that we're going to look at specifically looks at League of Legends esports. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with League of Legends, it's kind of akin to a video game sort of capture the flags. You have teams of five that are aiming to defeat an enemy base. And every person on that team of five is able to pick their own character or champion with special abilities. And for the purposes of this case study, we are talking about Tom Kench, who is a champion in League of Legends and is the titular catfish. And when he was introduced to the game, he had a mechanic that no other character had called grey health. What you would usually see is that those health bars up there would have dark red and dark or bright red and bright green to the left and then a very faded red and a faded green to the, to the right to indicate health that had been lost. But in Tom Kench's case you can see that there's a big chunk of the health bar that's grey. That's because that indicates the grey health which is a shield that Tom Kench puts up so at this point he's effectively unkillable. And this is where we find out how many colourblind people are in the audience today, because we're going to put a colourblind filter over that. And what we find is that's not actually so clear. It's very difficult to tell the difference between the grey health and that faded red and faded green that indicates health that the character has lost. Now, you might not think that there are that many colourblind people who play video games. On the contrary, Tom Kench actually resulted in a tweet from a professional player 
saying, if you didn't know, I'm colourblind, along with two other members of my team, and all three of us can't see what health he's at in colourblind mode. The reason that the professional player put this tweet out was because him and his team effectively couldn't play when Tom Kench was on the battlefield, which meant that they were unable to do their jobs. Oops. So, to their credit, Riot Games, the owners of League of Legends, did actually rectify this situation fairly quickly after it was brought to their attention. But what's worth noting here is that, as you can see from the screenshots, most colourblind people can't tell the difference between red and green, and if they can't see a colour, that colour is going to look very much grey or black to them. Now, colourblind people will generally use contrast to tell the difference between colour colours that they can't see. But one thing that you have to bear in mind is that even in a colourblind mode, not all of the colours will necessarily be clear to people. And if you are developing a colourblind mode where you're using icons, those icons should definitely be unambiguous. So how do we improve it? Well, first of all, you want to use a contrast checker to ensure that elements will be viewable by colourblind people. You can use a contrast checker, you can also use something like Colour Oracle, put colourblindness filters over it, or get colourblind people to test it, even, pardon me, even if you do have a colourblind mode, because then it will make it much easier to work out where the issues might actually be. Now, it's not just red or green colourblindness. There is actually blue colourblindness, or tritinopia, and there's also a chromatopsia, which is a complete lack of colour vision. And when you're designing, although they're a much smaller percentage of the population, it is still good practice to make sure that you design modes for them. Slack, the messaging app that probably a lot of people here use as well, does this really well. If you go in and you have a look at their accessibility settings, you can actually see there that there's not only a theme for protonopia and deuteranopia, which are red and green colour blindness, there's also one for tritonopia, which is blue colour blindness. And then if you do end up setting up a colourblind mode, and this is obviously not as applicable to things like League of Legends, but if you do, you want to make sure that you're using meaningful icons to indicate different elements and states. So it's going to be much more useful if you have, say, a star, a heart, a lightning bolt, and a bright pink rose, than it is if you have a square, a rounded rectangle, and a circle, which are fairly ambiguous. Now, 2020 has been a bit of an interesting year. We've had a lot of upheaval in the world, and even here in Australia, we've had a couple of fairly major disasters. Earlier in the year, we had the bushfires, and at the moment, we've got the COVID-19 pandemic. One thing that that's raised awareness of, as we have our Prime Minister and the Premiers and the Premiers and Chief Ministers of each state often doing press conferences, is sign language interpreters who, when these folks are on television, will often be standing next to them, interpreting what they're saying. The reason for that is so that deaf and hard of hearing people are able to actually absorb that information for people whose first language is Australian Sign Language, so that they don't have to go elsewhere to get it in an emergency. Now, sign language interpreting is important, but it's not the only way to make that information accessible to everyone. Another way to do that is by live captioning things. And there's a lot of automated software out there that does that, a lot of folks think that automated software is a solution for their podcasts or what have you, but that's not always the case. Let's take a look at this tweet from Cal Montgomery, a disability rights activist in the US, who's writing about a national disability organisation. He says, If you value us equally and want us to participate fully, we need full access to the Pulse briefing with enough lead time to absorb it. That chance is gone for this year, which means that you have just sabotaged your own legislative agenda by leaving advocates unprepared. Now, the reason that Cal put out this tweet was that the National Disability Advocacy Organisation, of which he was a member, had produced a briefing where the only text, the only text that was provided to support it was automated captioning. And if you're wondering where Pulse comes from, that's what the automated captioning software rendered policy as. The podcast This American Life also uses automated captioning software to help them with producing transcriptions of their podcasts. But rather than just put it up, they then have a human transcriber review it to make sure that it's accurate. They do have a notation on their website that says that This American Life is produced for the ear and designed to be heard, but if you're deaf or hard of hearing or otherwise text reliant, you're still able to consume This American Life through looking at the transcript, which has been corrected by a human transcriber. 
The ABC is another organisation that generally does transcripts really well. For a lot of their radio and television, they will actually provide either closed captions at the bottom of the video or a text transcript that people can read out later. With that said, even they're not perfect, because if we look at this if we look at this Radio National Breakfast show from the 24th of August 2020, where we could see the transcript button on the previous slide, there's actually no transcript here for this at all. However, at least the ABC makes an effort. One of the other major producers of podcasts in Australia are the Australian Guardian. Now, the Australian Guardian produce a number of podcasts, including one about Australian politics weekly, which is a really good source of news about both the bushfires and the COVID-19 pandemic. Unfortunately, the Guardian's strategy about transcribing their podcasts is not to do it at all, as we can see from this headline, Guardian Podcasts, Why No Transcripts? Yeah, I'm going to be honest, that's probably not ideal if you want people to be able to access your news. Oops. And one important thing to note here is that text-reliant people aren't necessarily deaf or hard of hearing. Autistic folks, people with sensory processing disorders, people with things like migraines or tinnitus, where they might not always be able to understand or parse or even stand listening to someone talking, will tend to be text-reliant at least some or all of the time. So if you transcribe things properly, then you're opening up your audio and video content to a much wider audience. Whereas if you don't, there's actually quite a number of people who are completely unable to access it. So how do we improve it? Well, you want to provide transcripts for any spoken audio that you have on your website. And that means that anyone who's text reliant will be able to go on your website rather than trying to listen to something that they may not be able to hear they can just read through the transcript and they can get information about what's going on. The same holds for videos. One thing that you'll notice that I've done here is that below the slides, there's a little black box that in it has captions that explain what I'm saying. And that means that if there are deaf or hard of hearing or otherwise text reliant folks who are listening to this talk at the moment, then they don't have to listen to what I'm saying or try to lip read me. They can just read the captions and they know what I'm saying. Now, Captions and transcriptions shouldn't just explain what, or shouldn't just lay out what someone is saying. They should also explain things like background noise, like there might be cars honking in the background of a video, or they should explain changes in vocal tone. If you look at transcriptions and captions that are produced by things like Netflix for movies, you'll often see that they'll actually say that someone is speaking angrily or brightly or happily. And automated transcription software is not a bad place to start, but it's not a complete solution. You should always make sure that if you're using automated transcription software or captioning software, that you have a human review and correct that transcription before it's published. Otherwise, you end up with things like the Pulse briefing, which leaves folks like Cal Montgomery out in the cold. Hacking an artificial pancreas. Now, you can kind of read that in two different ways because we could be talking about hacking together an artificial pancreas, or we could be talking about hacking into one. In fact, this case study actually covers both. This up here is a Medtronic Minimed insulin pump. Basically, diabetic people can hook themselves up to these so that rather than having to regularly inject themselves with insulin, they can have the insulin pump do it for them. It's much more akin to what the pancreas, which is the organ that doesn't function properly for people with diabetes, will generally do in healthy people. Now, the Minimed insulin pump in this picture actually had a really major security flaw in it. And that was interesting because one thing that happened was that a lot of diabetic people started hunting down these obsolete insulin pumps despite the fact that they had a security flaw. The reason for that was that these Minimed insulin pumps could communicate with a remote that someone could use to deliver insulin to themselves via a very common radio frequency. What a couple of people had actually worked out was that if you could get a constant blood glucose monitor, which is implanted under the skin and delivers information using that same radio frequency, you could hook the two of them up together and effectively create an artificial pancreas so that as your blood sugar fluctuated, the Minimed insulin pump would deliver appropriate amounts of insulin. Now that was great. It was a security flaw that someone was able to exploit to benefit a large number of people. Unfortunately, there were also some unintended consequences of that, because obviously anything that has a security flaw, like these Medtronic insulin pumps, 
is vulnerable to hacker attacks. Now, the FDA, which is the sort of organization in the US that regulates Medtronic, didn't really take this too seriously for a while. I mean, they issued an alert on Medtronic insulin pump security so that people were aware, but they didn't really make the time to see what might actually happen if someone was able to exploit this. There were a few scientists who weren't particularly impressed at that, and so they decided that they were going to have a go at exploiting it themselves. Which led to this headline, these hackers made an app that kills to prove a point. Because what the ethical hackers had worked out was that not only could these mini-med insulin pumps communicate with blood glucose monitors, they could also communicate with any smartphone and with a little bit of hacking, a lot of TV remotes. Which is not really terribly ideal. And so what these hackers had done was they had produced an Android app that anyone could install on their Android phone, which would hook up to that really common radio frequency and deliver a lethal dose of insulin to any user of a Minimed insulin pump in the vicinity. Which finally prompted Medtronic through the FDA to recall their vulnerable Minimed insulin pumps. Oh dear. Now, when you're developing medical devices or health applications in general, accessibility issues aren't just about design. Often then security issues can actually be an accessibility issue because they can potentially render the device or the application completely useless or, in the worst case, potentially be used to kill people. And it's a really important thing to consider when you develop those kinds of health applications and medical devices. People are giving you a lot of private information and you do often hold lives in your hands. The issue with that is that if you're regulated by an external organization like the FDA, they may not actually tell you about those kinds of issues quickly or even necessarily at all. So you need to make sure that you're across it so that you don't end up being on the back foot if something happens like it did with the mini-med insulin pumps. So how do we improve it? Well, the first thing to do, I mean, really just sort of institute good security principles. And the first thing to do there is you want to consider the possible attack vectors. So I'm building a health app or I'm building a medical device. How might a black hat person or someone who wants to hack this to get information or to hurt people try to exploit that? Then you want to conduct penetration testing and you generally want to do that before your device or application goes to market. So you get in skilled security professionals who you pay and they will basically try to attack that device for you and then give you a list of findings so that you can remediate them. If people do make you aware of security vulnerabilities, then it's a good idea to respond promptly to them. Not only will you show people that you're serious, but you'll potentially not be opening yourself up to liability later down the line. The really sad thing about this case study is actually that unintended uses can often be a business opportunity. If Medtronic had been aware of people using these mini med insulin pumps to hook this up, and they had decided that they were going to try and produce a device that was a continuous blood glucose monitor hooked up to an insulin pump, that would have opened this up to a huge number of people who didn't have the technical know-how to hack it together themselves, and it would have been a great business opportunity for them. As I speak, it's been, I think, about six years since these Minimed insulin pumps were recalled. And Medtronic is still working on a device that does that. As far as I'm aware, it hasn't yet come to market. Hopefully it does at some point, because I think it will be much more beneficial to a lot of people, and hopefully much more secure than the artificial pancreas that people hack together themselves. Now, I've been giving this talk for probably about eight or nine months now. And one thing that happened with this, even though I use a walking stick, is I became much more interested not just in my own accessibility requirements, but in accessibility in general. And so I've tried to sort of keep an eye on what's going on in that world, so that if I learn things, I can integrate them into my accidental accessibility advocacy. One way that I've done that is through my LinkedIn feed. And so one day I was scrolling through my LinkedIn feed, having a look at all of the things that people had to say. And a post popped up saying, hey, if you want to hear an accessibility advocate, come and give a talk about designing accessible, or if you want to hear an accessibility consultant rather, come and give a talk about designing accessible websites. It's on this date at this time. And I thought, great, cool. I know some things about accessibility. Oh, obviously a lot more about the things that are applicable to me, but I can't know everything. So I'm gonna go along and listen to this person because 
most more likely than not, I'm going to learn something that I didn't know. So I take myself off work at 4.30, I get on the train, and I show up to the venue to see this. I'm just going to let that sink in for a minute. Now, the real kicker here was that it wasn't just that one set of stairs. Past the glass doors, there were actually three sets of stairs in total that I had to stagger up to get to the lift that would then take me to level one, where the event was being held. So I managed to stagger my way up there, and before the talk started I thought, alright, let's see what's going on around here. Are there any accessible bathrooms? So I explored the whole building, and not only did I find that there were no accessible bathrooms in the building at all, the regular bathrooms were down the fire escape, which was another three flights of stairs. Not ideal. Um, I described it later to people as being like a room bar, sitting in front of a set of stairs that it knows it can't get up, and just repeatedly shouting error 406, which for folks who are not well versed in HTML error codes means not acceptable. I don't really think that I need to explain the irony of this situation. I did listen to the talk, and at the end of the talk I actually asked the accessibility consultant, does it strike you as ironic that you're giving a talk about accessibility in an inaccessible building, and that I had to take my walking stick and stagger up three flights of stairs to be able to hear you talk? And it hadn't even occurred to him. And I think that that is really interesting when you talk about making things accessible to people. So I probably don't really need to explain to you what the issue is, but let's do the post-mortem anyway. The first thing that you want to do to improve this is, and it's quite obvious, to make sure that your venues are wheelchair accessible and that they do have disabled bathrooms. Because if that's not the case, disabled folks just aren't going to show up. One thing that you can do which is sort of more advanced is to provide things like quiet spaces for autistic folks or people with migraines, and also to provide adaptive technology like sign language interpreters, hearing loops which are another thing that a lot of deaf and hard of hearing people will use. You can hook your hearing aid up to it, and then it means it filters out a lot of the background noise. And for blind or vision impaired folks, you can have audio descriptions of slides. One thing that you would notice that I've been doing as I've been speaking is I've tried to, where I've had slides that have images, describe what's going on. Now, another thing that's important here is that you want to include people with disabilities in these discussions about accessibility. Because you might find that there aren't a lot of people with disabilities around, and at that point, you've really got to ask yourself who's not in the room and why aren't they here? Because once you can build that empathy and you can start getting disabled people involved with what you're doing, then it will make it much easier to actually get their input on things. So, to recap, accessibility benefits everyone, not just disabled people. One quote that someone gave me while I was doing this that I really liked was the screen readers are great if you're blind, but they're also great if you've got two toddlers and you just want to be able to read a book. And when you're designing things accessibly, building accessibility into your design principles from the start is the way you really want to do it. And if you're de designing things like medical devices or health apps, that's not just going to be about design. Other issues like security risks can also potentially be accessibility issues for you there. Now, I would always recommend, if you can, getting adaptive technology users to test your software. But if you can't, when you're doing testing, think about the things that disabled people might need to do differently. If there's one takeaway that I want you to take from this talk, it's that you need to listen to your users. Because we will always know what's best for us, and we can give you that feedback and help you act on it. There are a few thanks due to Melissa who produced the fancy corporate website, to Matt for taking the screenshots of Confluence that I couldn't get, and to my friend Annie who produced the great accessibility Roomba. There is, I believe, now some time to take questions. If there's any questions that you think of that you would like me to answer later, there's a website and an email address up there. I do hope that all of you have learnt something, and I hope that if you ever have to get into accessibility advocacy, it's going to be a bit le it's going to be a bit less accidental than mine was. Thank you so much, Dawn. That was great, and I know that uh, Twitter has been really loud. I know that you've been very engaged in the chat as well, where there's been a lot of conversations going on. So thank you really very much for coming and being part of PyCon Online 2020. Yes, 
thank you for having me. Uh, if I did miss any questions or if you have any questions or you want to talk to me about anything that I have raised, uh, I will take myself over to the video hallway as soon as I leave stream here and you can ask me whatever you want to ask me there. Excellent. Thank you so much again. And uh, yeah, if everybody uh, who wants to chat to Dawn follows them over to the video hallway, that'd be great. Um, so we have a short break before our next talk. Um, but just before we do, I have a word from our organizers. Would you like to get fresh eyes on your project? Do you want to get warm fuzzies from helping people out? There are still plenty of mentor slots available for Sunday's mentored sprints at PyConline AU. Check out the site for more details and how to register. And so for the site, we're talking about the Sunday page on the website. So if you go to program Sunday, there's all the information that you need, but we really do want people to sign up for mentored spaces at our sprints that are, be, uh, that are happening tomorrow. Well, yeah, tomorrow, Sunday, and um, hopefully I'll see you there. So we're gonna take a short break now, but we'll be back very soon with our next speaker.